Imagine you have a 1 and zeros next to it. Add two adjacent numbers together and place the sum below them. Now we have another row. Continue by placing zeros to the edge and add adjacent numbers in the same way in order to generate the next row. We can do this infinitely and to make things look clean, we can remove the excess zeros on the edge. What we have created is called Pascal's Triangle. What seems simple is littered with mathematical gems and patterns. One such pattern is found by adding the numbers in a row together, which gives 2 to the power of that row. Or the pattern you might see in the diagonals, such as the first diagonal consisting of only ones, the second diagonal the natural numbers, and the third diagonal the triangular numbers, and so on. But the most important of them all is how Pascal's triangle is really just combinations. Something that seems unrelated, but is the basis for all other patterns that appear in Pascal's triangle. To understand how and why combinations relate to it, we must first take a different journey into counting the number of parts on a grid. Imagine you have a grid with points A and B. How many parts are there from A to B, given that we can only take a step downwards or to the right? One way to solve this problem is by considering the number of parts to another point that is closer to A, to simplify the problem rather than just counting the number of paths to be. So what's a simpler point we could think of? Well, the simplest one is just A itself. So how many paths are there from A to A? Well, that would be one, and that is by doing nothing, taking no steps. For the point to the right of A, there will be one step there by taking a right step, and here are some other points. Feel free to verify them. Now, let's consider a point that is not on the edge of the grid. For example, this point. We can count the number of paths here by drawing the paths out first. And notice that both paths must pass through the two points before it. So we can see that the number of paths to that point must be equal to the sum of the number of paths from the two points prior. This is because there's no other way any path could get to the current point other than passing those two points. We can now fill the grid with some more points. And let's also consider this point. I'll draw out some paths first. And notice here how all the paths passed through the two points before it, just like how we did it for the point 2. So we can once again see that the total number of paths there is equal to 1 plus 2, which is 3. In general, if we want to count the number of paths to B, we know that if we call the two points prior to B, N and M, having N paths and M paths, the number of paths to be would be n plus m, using the same logic as before. And here are some paths I've drawn out, just showing that either way it must pass through n or m. However, in order to find n or m, we must find the points before it and add them together. But to find those points, we must find the points before it and so on. So we must ultimately fill the grid with the number of paths for each point to find the number of paths to be. So we see that there are 70 paths to B, but we also see quite an interesting pattern. That is, the number we filled out looks exactly like the numbers in Pascal's triangle, and if we rotate the grid by 45 degrees, we see that the numbers exactly correspond to the numbers in Pascal's triangle. Why? Well, that is because on grid, 
The number of paths to the point is given by the sum of the points before it. Just like how we formed Pascal's triangle, which was by adding the two terms before it and placing the sum below. So ultimately, Pascal's triangle really just represents the number of paths to each point. For example, the number 6 here really just represents that there are 6 paths to that point. However, there is another way we could count the number of paths on a grid, and that is by combinations. Imagine we have a 3 by 4 grid, and once again, we want to count the number of paths from A to B. Here are some paths I've drawn out, and notice that whatever path I take, I must take exactly 3 steps down and 4 steps to the right, so a total of 7 steps. What makes one path different to another is where the right and down steps occur. For example, if we call a right step R and a down step D, then the blue path would represent R D R R D D and the yellow path D D R R D R R. If we were to randomly generate another path, it would also have another set of R's and D's that is different. So, instead of asking how many paths are there, we can change our problem to asking how many arrangements of rights and downs are there, given that there must be 4 rights and 3 downs. Here are some examples. To solve this problem, let's say that we start with 7 steps not labeled right or down yet. We must choose 4 out of 7 steps to be a right step, for example, these steps here, 2, 5, 3, 6, and we must let the other steps be a down step. The process of choosing 4 out of 7 can be given by 7 choose 4. If we haven't done combinations in a while, let me read why this works. Let's first consider choosing one step to be right. And now we will have six choices for the other steps because one is already chosen. And now we have five choices left for the third right step and four choices left for the fourth right step. So to count the number of arrangements, we can simply multiply the choices together. However, also notice that there may be overcounts here because, well, if we swap the R's around, this would result in a new arrangement, but in reality, it's not a new arrangement, so we must divide by 4 factorial. This is given by 7 choose 4. The number of paths from A to B is therefore 7 choose 4, but in general, if there are N steps and R right steps, the number of paths will be given by n choose r. And by using this idea, we can return to our original grid, but instead of adding points to find the next point, we can simply use the idea of combinations to fill out the entire grid. Feel free to pause and think about what is going on here. What is fascinating about this is that we established that the number of paths for each point in the grid is actually the numbers in Pascal's triangle. So what we see here is that Pascal's triangle can be written using these combinations. And there's actually a specific pattern here, which I will go over. Look at the diagonals here. Notice how the n or the top number, which represents the total number of steps, stays constant throughout the diagonal, and is one more than the previous diagonal. For example, the purple diagonal has an n of 4, but also notice that the points in the diagonal increments in the bottom number or the number of right steps. To understand this, let's only consider the purple diagonal here, and let's draw a path to 4 shoes 0. Notice that there must be exactly 4 down steps, however, the path to 4 shoes 1 still uses 4 steps, but one of the down steps become a right step, so 3 down and 1 right. For 4 shoes 2, one down step becomes a right step, 
the same thing occurs for 4 shoes 3 and 4 shoes 4. So we see that throughout the diagonal, the number of steps stays constant, and that is why the end stays at 4. And notice that moving along the diagonal, the right steps also increment by 1 because we're taking one more right step at each point. Now we're going to see this pattern when we write the combinations in Pascal's triangle. In general, the term at row n and r to the right of the left diagonal is given by n choose r. And by convention, we label the first row row 0, the second row row 1, and so on. So not only does Pascal's triangle represent the number of paths on a grid, but it is also given by combinations. And the patterns we see in Pascal's triangle here are actually just the patterns in combinations. And without the help of Pascal's triangle, these patterns may never have been discovered. One such pattern or identity is Pascal's identity. From the way we constructed Pascal's triangle, if we add two terms next to each other, it would be equal to the term below it. But now that we're looking at this from the perspective of combinations, we can form quite an interesting identity. n choose r plus n choose r plus 1 will be equal to n plus 1 choose r plus 1. Once again, feel free to try this out with some numbers. Another pattern that I introduced at the beginning of the video is how the sum of each row is equal to 2 to the power of that row. Why? Well, adding the numbers in a row could be thought of as adding the total number of paths to each point in that row thus giving the total number of paths to row 3, regardless of the point it must land on. An alternative way we could think of this is by choosing the paths from the top point. And notice that at each uh, point, there are two choices of path to go down, either taking a down left step or a down right step. So therefore, the total path would be given by 2 times 2 times 2, which is just 2 cubed. There are much more patterns, but I will stop here because I want you to discover some of your own and prove them maybe. So have fun. Bye bye.